So just to say again, to, to call your attention to the icon here, uh, I bought this icon, uh, this Rublev Trinity, for this convention, and, and it will hang in the new mission training area of Evans House. It's just recently completed, reminding us that as we train and equip leaders for the new, uncertain, strange times we find ourselves in, uh, that we are in communion uh, with, with God the Trinity, who is always drawing us out into deeper community. And as uh, Dwight reminded us last night, there is that open place in front of the table for all of us uh, to be, so that we might draw into community with God and with each other and spread the gospel by drawing others out into this grace-filled communion. Now, I wanted to... Um, I'm remembering, I have two uh, memories and two connections to the walkabouts or the period that I was preparing uh, to at least convince you uh, that I might be uh, a good bishop for you. And I remember uh, Martha uh, talking, and I'll get to those two things. I remember Martha at one of the walkabouts in Salem, it was the last one, it was on Sunday, and um, she had a chance to address everybody there, and, and um, uh, she did say some profound things, but the first thing she said was, I hope this is over in time for Downton Abbey. <laughs> and everybody, how many Downton Abbey fans in this room? Yeah, a bunch of Anglophiles you are. I'm a fan too, this soap opera that is uh, set in. Um, but it got a big laugh and it really was, I think, a really turning point. It was really helped uh, you elect me, I think. Uh, her, her, her thing, just her saying that, sort of. I want to think that it was really, but I do believe it had a lot more to do with the Holy Spirit. But, but a lot's happened with Downton Abbey in the past two and a half years. <laughs> You know, and, and I think it mirrors a little bit of where we find ourselves, right? I mean, they've been through the war and everything. And in this final season, uh, they are struggling with the sort of collapse of, of what used to be, right? And everybody, um, some are seeing this as tragic, everything falling apart. And others, like Daisy, are seeing it as opportunity for moving up. And so you have a whole range of characters dealing with this, right? You have a total denial, right? Stiff upper lip, make a go of it in the old way, right? Keep up appearances. And you have realists, right? Some are selling the place. Some are just, you know, drowning in the way it used to be in the big manor house, believing things, the former glory will sort of come back, or if I can hire another footman, uh, everything will be okay. So that's an image for us as we move away, and I'll just not take anything away from what I know Dwight will lead us into. We're just not in that place anymore. And so maybe that's, um, I don't want to be cynical, but maybe there's a little bit, and that's what we watched down and thinking, oh, it was so nice when it was like that. <laughs> and you just rang the bell and somebody came up. And... <laughs> so just switch uh, a little bit. Um, I was having a conversation with um, Nick Baines, who's the bishop, new bishop of West Yorkshire and the Dales. We've been keeping in touch ever since my visit there in the summer. And um, uh, we talked a little bit by Skype uh, the other day, and he reminded me, he was um, praying for us, and I told him we were praying for them, and um, the Bradford Youth Exchange will be coming here this um, summer uh, with a bunch of kids, and maybe Bishop Toby uh, Howarth, who's the new bishop for the Bradford area, will also be with us. But we were talking, and um, Nick reminded me, uh, he, uh, a quote from um, Soren Kierkegaard, that's what Nick's always doing, come up with these. We're having this, I'm saying something really sort of, you know, pedestrian, and then he just says something from Soren Kierkegaard. Um, <laughs> it's kind of like, okay, I'm signing off now. Um, but he said, um, Soren Kierkegaard said, life can only be understood backwards, but must be lived forwards. Only be understood backwards, but must be lived forwards. And that's the time we find ourselves in, I think. Um, understanding who we are and what we are, but having to live it forward and in, into an uncertain time. So it's a great, um, the other thing about being elected uh, your bishop in that walkabout period, and I, I, um, 
um, say to Dwight that it's, I think, no small uh, uh, role on his part that I was elected here uh, a little bit. He doesn't know this. But, um, but that I was reading people the way, you know, as I was thinking about how to talk about the thoughts I had, and I was reading, think, these are my thoughts, right? They're really his thoughts. But it helped me articulate, became a kind of... Um, 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 you know, sort of a, a mission statement for me as I talk to you all. So I was sort of channeling a hymn to you, and we have been using that book, reading it around the diocese, thinking about how to be uh, the mission um, of God. And it shaped then, as we went forward, our mission action plan. And it's continuing to shape missional conversations around our diocese. And so we are blessed, Dwight, to have you here today and hear about the Agile Church and the thoughts that you have for us. And we'll take that book into our common life and begin to think about it. Just a couple quick things, because I want um, Dwight to get up here and we're uh, running, I'll speak for like five more minutes, and then whatever I don't get, I'll either I'll squeeze it in later or, or something. And I got a few things yesterday, but just for... Um, for Dwight too, to for him to know a little bit about, we've talked a little bit about our mission action plan. I want you all who are new uh, to hear just a couple things that we've accomplished in, in the past year. I want to start with uh, reminding you, especially those of you who are new, of the state of the parishes of our diocese. It's just a general sketch. We really are realistic about who we are. Um, we have 56 congregations. 23 of our congregations, that's less than half, have full-time paid clergy. Okay, that's less than half, 23. 15 of our congregations have a part-time arrangement. Somebody who's there most of the time, a retired um, priest or some uh, ongoing arrangement. And eight, the 18 others then are small and use some kind of supply rotation. So it just gives you a sense of who we are. Less than half employing a full-time uh, priest. And some of those uh, churches that are em employing a full-time priest used to employ more than one full-time priest. So um, it sets us up, me saying that, for um, just so we're realistic, uh, not like um, you know the Dowager and, and Downton thinking that things will just sort of never change, that things have changed. But as uh, Dwight said to us last night, God is not finished with us yet. We just need to be open to what's next for us. So we put together a mission action plan, and uh, the vision of that plan, uh, the vision statement at the beginning of it, and I'm just going to read a couple pieces from that early preamble so that you hear it, new people hear it, we hear it again, Dwight hears it. The vision statement was in order to join in God's mission in this time and place, the Diocese of Southwestern Virginia will, will be a household of congregations in which each parish will make its own blessings and challenges and desires of the heart known. And diocesan leaders will respond tangibly through direct consultative services, building bridges between parishes and resources. We went on to say that it is the mission of God to draw all creation into communion. God the Holy Spirit enlivens the church to go out and make communion in Christ's name and in the world. The work of the church is to pray, to plan, and to act to join God in the mission of communion. So becoming the missional church means being a church whose primary focus is centered on God's mission. So we had 10 or so goals, and I'm going to go over them just real briefly, but we've accomplished all the goals that we set out last year, every single one of them. Um, some of them are done, some of them are in process, and I'm going to remind you quickly of what they are. The first thing we were going to do was to create some canon missioners who would be relational diocesan resources. So Mark, Kathy, Jonathan, Melissa, and now Connor form a whole mission team. And I know that you've seen them and they're out there uh, reaching out to you and in all of our congregations and creating way more work for me. I almost think, why did I even think this was going to be a good idea? But, they're, but the good side of that is they're creating more work because they're in relationship with you, and we're talking about you all every week. We're planning, we're thinking, what's going on in the diocese? What can we uh, do better? What do we need to learn? And, we're, and you're helping us learn that. It's a sort of conversation that we're having. 
The next thing we said we would do would be to hire a canon missioner for youth and young adult ministry. And that position was created to call an ordained priest whose mission agenda will address youth ministry, campus ministry, and young adult ministry throughout the diocese. And we've called the Reverend Connor Gwynn, a 25-year-old who's really helping our mission team uh, think uh, like and help us adapt to uh, the millennials and the young adult populations that we really desperately need to reach. I ordained him in December and we will commission him tomorrow. He is a kind of outward invisible sign of our commitment to reaching youth and young adult. And he's part of our mission team, as I say, in helping us think through these things. Now, a new goal uh, in this area is that we will create, we have already started, and you heard a little bit about yesterday, to create an intentional young adult community. It's going to be called the Aiden Community, after a St. Aiden, who was an, a northern English missionary, later the Bishop of Lindisfarne, and he was tireless walking around and being with people and evangelizing them. And these four or five young adults that live in intentional community uh, will be a kind of new missionary. And these communities will be models and incubators for other uh, intentional faith community initiatives. And we have set an ambitious goal of forming four of those uh, communities uh, in this diocese. Soon, I hope. The goals three and four are that we would use our deacons and our supply priests missionally. And that means that we are sharing resources and we're thankful for the ministry of, of clergy and of our deacons who are uh, on a, a, a rotation that Mark and Kathy have a spreadsheet on so that all of our congregations have um, Eucharist on some Sundays of the month or have preaching or teaching uh, led by um, the clergy that we have at our disposal. We are uh, engaging uh, transition ministry missionally. That's the fifth goal. So we have interim team ministry in five of our parishes that are now in search. And there's a video later today uh, during that mission workshop, the larger mission workshop that'll be in this room. And you'll see about a 10 minute video of how that uh, mission team uh, stuff is working. We created a diocesan pastoral response team to deal with all sorts of things that might arise in our congregations from, from um, um, conflict resolution to uh, just supporting a, a congregation in transition. Uh, we revised the Commission on Ministry. Uh, it is now open and we have uh, a lot of people already interested. If you're interested in, in holy orders, either to be a priest or a deacon or know someone who the time to let me or members of the Commission on Ministry know of those people. Um, one of the ways that we are going, and then the other goal was that we would have uh, curacies or places where our um, newly ordained can come out and be formed for ministry in the church. Uh, and those are, we have one and we're starting in Blacksburg and Emily Lukonich has been filling that role. And we have another one beginning to start uh, in um, June when Becky Krieger uh, graduates from Sewanee and um, it will be in Stanton working with Paul Nankara at Trinity, um, uh, once again being at uh, Stewart Hall School as a chaplain, and then helping us with a young adult community there. We created a Dawson uh, Planned Giving and Stewardship Resource Group. There's a workshop on that for those who are interested. We trained four people, Trip Durison, the Reverend Jim Lively, the Reverend Emily Edmondson, and Avis Ahern. And we will be training six to eight more people who will become resources for major gifts, stewardship plan giving around this diocese. I'm moving quickly now so that we get to Dwight. Um, we've added a few new mission goals. Um, one is we will create a task force for ministry to people with disabilities, and my Martha and Darla Schum will head that task force so that we can think about and be aware of the many types of disabilities um, around our diocese in our communities and how we might reach out. And you'll hear me say uh, something by way of an illustration in the sermon tomorrow. We are going to provide, and another goal is a new goal, is we're going to provide and coordinate Christian formation resources for children. We're doing a lot for youth, young adults, and campus, but we didn't have 
old that provided resources for the little ones, and so we're gonna, um, that will be a, a new thing for us. Uh, it's not a new thing to educate uh, little children, uh, but, <laughs> because you all are doing a great job of that in our parishes, but to coordinate and network. When one place is doing um, um, something really interesting, we can um, let other people uh, and other parishes know about it. And the final new goal is to develop a new uh, communication strategy that will improve uh, our current offerings and engage emerging social media opportunities. So there's just so much that's coming up and we need to be able to respond to it. My final thought as I was coming back to England. When I was there this summer, we were in a small village and I was speaking to the vicar and asking him how many people, how many members were in his parish. And this looked like a little teeny place that didn't have much going on. The pamphlets looked like they were from last century. And um, he said, about 20,000 people in this parish. And I remembered, you right, that the parish, I mean, it's obvious, is, is a boundary, it's like a county. But they think of, and they are um, put together that way, the parish is more than just the building. It refers to that sort of territory. It's like in Louisiana, so, but that's a whole different uh, kind of territory. But, <laughs> but, but when I looked up parish, this is, the, this is the interesting thing, and this is where I'm gonna leave you. When I looked up uh, the origin of the word parish, it's uh, first a seen in the English language in the 13th century, and it comes to us from old French, from a Latinization of the ancient Greek, of course. And um, that word is parochia, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, and it means sojourning in a foreign land. Sojourning in a foreign land, or dwelling beside, stranger, sojourner. Isn't it remarkable that parish means something like uh, being um, dwelling beside, being a stranger, being a sojourner? What if we began to think of our congregations not as our little fiefdoms, our little Downton Abbeys ringing the bell and wondering why no one else comes up and serves us tea anymore, <laughs> that we start thinking about um, it just being a tent where we are in this strange land, dwelling beside the neighbor, and starting to think about our parish boundary being, um, you know, the people that are around us, however many miles before you get to the next church. Those are our people. Those are members. Those are the, who the Holy Spirit is reaching out to and asking us to reach out to. And so let's um, give the floor now the doctors were shyly, shyly, and um, we're just really glad you're with us. Go ahead.